Uh, this is being recorded, folks. So if you don't want it, if you don't want your face being seen, um, that's fine. But obviously, that's okay. Um, so I'm I want to take on my little journey tonight. Um, right, Gareth, how is your microphone tonight? Right, that's okay. We can't we can't lip read that, Gareth. Unfortunately, we can't hear you at this minute. But Gareth, if you can, if you can hear us, thumbs up. Well, that's okay. Don't matter. Um, I want um, who am I going to who am I going to get to join me tonight? Um, Pam, how is your voice tonight? Yeah, it's fine. Oh, I love I love that. You can join me tonight. Um, I always get Dell to join me because he's a, a very a very nice man. Um, <laughs> And actually, I'm going to get Peter to join me. So it's going to be um, actually, I'll have I'll have Peter, yep. um, Pam, and uh, Dell to join me tonight. Um, uh, anything anyone want to say before we get started? Uh, before we start, I've got yep. a little poem that's written by an 11 year old boy, and it's the day the world changed. It's an amazing little poem for 11 year old. I'll read it out to you now. It's not very long. Give it to us, because that's your... To world today, a nasty bug called COVID came to stay. They told us to wash our hands. It might go away. But it was not enough to keep the bug at bay. Lockdown was scary. It made me cry. I did not want anyone I knew to die. Schools were closed and shop shut too. At first I gave a big, big woo-hoo. And then we were told to stay at home. And soon I began to moan and groan. Homeschooling started. My mum tried her best, but she's not as good as my teacher, I must confess. Being with my family keeps me safe and well, but sometimes I feel like I'm living in a cell. An hour of exercise, exercise we are allowed every day. Sometimes it takes my sad feelings away. We clap on a Thursday for the NHS to show them we know they're trying their best. Scientists are trying to find a cure I'm opening for it soon, but I'm not so sure. I wish it was over. It was like all before. I will make sure that I see my family much, much more. I will never forget the day the world changed. The memories I have will always remain. I thought that was fantastic for a kid of 11. Mm -hmm. Oh, really great. Really great. Really great. Yeah, uh, to hear that. I, I've, I've, got, I've got some good news. Um, the the Vale of Glamorgan, um, uh, well, not the Vale of Glamorgan, a local charities um, issued Archaeology Cymru with two hundred pounds, and we we will be purchasing three computer tablets um, to enable uh, some of our most vulnerable who do not have computers to get involved with the classes. Right, good. So that's really good news. That is good news, and we've also applied for another <laughs> grant, um, which we will be. Um, we will it'll be me and rosamond out and about in the community taking Ooh, films ah. taking films of uh, locations and um there'll be no oh, fee for it if we if we get a grant <laughs> off the local authority um everyone will be getting these regular discs every week about journeys that we've been taking and um and that will be paid for by the taxpayer and um hopefully that'll come through as well so um so that's a bit of good news. Anything anyone else wants to say before we get started? I just want to make um, one further announcement. Um, next week, we will be looking at um, um, battle sites throughout, um, uh, throughout the, the landscape. Um, and then the following week, we'll be looking at um, notable um, historical trees, uh, which go back, um, some of them, thousands of years. So today is going to be a bit of an unusual one. I wanted to pull back from um, all out lectures on castles and big things like that. I'm going to be looking at um, some coinage associated with the Welsh princes. And there's a rather <coughs> strange story there. Some of it is con controversial. Um, we'll be also looking at um, an unusual sport that was played in um, Glamorgan and throughout Wales up until recent years, until it was banned. Um, and, um, and we'll talk, be talking about um, the 1st of May and some of the uh, traditions associated with the 1st of May throughout our wonderful land and a law that's been repealed um, and laws against the Welsh language. So that'll be a good thing to end with today. So what we're going to do, 
without further ado, we've got a nice group tonight. I'm going to mute everybody, then I'm going to unmute those who I want to join me. Right, so, right, there will be, um, Del will be joining me. Um, and um, where's Peter? I can't, I've lost, which one are you, Peter? Your owner, right, okay, You're, it's you. Um, and who else did I say, did I say Pam? Good. Pam, 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 Pam. Excellent. Right, okay then. So, um, I will, I will probably at times uh, display some text on the screen. Um, towards the end, I won't be displaying any images or text. So what I'd like to start off with um, is um, showing some um, showing some images, and hopefully it will come up. So, right. Sorry to go quiet a second. Right. After three, one, two, three. Um, what are you able to see on your screen, Dell, Rosamond, and Pam? A band or stick. I, a hockey stick. A hockey stick, exactly. Um, the the one the one thing um, the one thing, and I, what I'm going to do today is I I I move from referring to Wales as Wales or Cymru. Um, so today I'm going to refer. Uh, refer to Wales as Wales today instead of Cymru um, and next week he'll go back over to Cymru there's 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 a reason for my madness um, and I think I've already explained that we won't talk about the game Bando um, to begin with but I'd like to mention that um, to get an idea of the traditions across our land we've got to bring in sport um, as well, because lots of things um, are unfamiliar with you. Um, so a bando stick from around 1845 belonging to Thomas Thomas, a member of the Margam Bando Boys. Some of these artifacts are displayed in um, St. Fagans. Um, and I do believe I'm getting a little bit of um, feedback. Um, is anyone else getting any feedback? No, no he's coming from somewhere. There is a noise Not coming from, from me. Right. Okay. I, I'm going to I'm going to cut your mic, Pam. Unfortunately. So. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that, Pam. I think it might be you. Okay. Uh, it was actually Dell. So it's only you now, Peter. Oh. Okay. And that's that's a nice little thing. So a little bit of an introduction. So we, we, we go into um, this passage here. But before we talk about that passage, we're going to look at this man. Um, this is um, Haulvar, Haulvar, however you'd like to pronounce it. Um, and there's one thing that people will find on their travels associated with money and coins throughout Wales. And that's this. It's always said that the Welsh princes didn't produce coins in any way, shape or form. You scratch the surface, however, and you look at this one coin from Howell there, King Howell. And then you scratch the surface again, and you see another leader, Llewellyn Ap Yorath, also producing coins. And then you start thinking about the Rhudland Mint in North Wales. And then you start to unpeel the layers of covered up history and you start to understand that there was, there was a number of coins in circulation in Wales produced by Welsh princes. And this is one of the aims of doing this course to bring new avenues of research to you. So let's get back to that little text there. This is, this is stating coinage of how all there from 913 to 948. That's a bit of an anathema, really. Um, this document was published in 1905. I've only managed to get access to it today. 
And it's about a chapter in a publication that looks at three coins that were bought at auction. And one of those coins turned out to be a coin that had um, the words Howell, Howell the, or um, King Howell um, associated with that coin um, amongst three coins. And up until 1900, it was whispered that one or two coins had existed associated by Welsh princes, but they had been dismissed by the historians of the day. But by 1906, a coin issued by a Welsh leader came to pass and is now on display in the British Museum of all places. You've probably already read this, but we'll come back to this. And the word Eadmund is mentioned, associated with one of the other two pennies found with the coin of Howell there. Um, and that's rather interesting because the mania that produced the coin of Howell um, was a mania from the Chester Mint. Um, and he also issued coins for Anglo-Saxon leaders as well. Rather interesting that to start off with. There he is, Howell Thar. If anyone knows anything about Howell Thar, they'll be very aware that Howell Thar was a man that saw law being a codification of the land. He saw that laws and the rewriting of laws were really important. And it's also said that having laws and money and having an army and all these different things also relied upon a monetary system. This wasn't to be a system of just bartering. It's absolute nonsense sometimes to think that people of Wales only went to a market holding a chicken or only went to market with a cow or a sheep. They were so backwards um, that they didn't have access to coins. I think that idea needs to be rewritten. And he's a kingly man. And one thing that I've said in a lecture that I'll be delivering tomorrow to those that are part of my Archaeology Cymru classes, um, you will, you'll hear me um, in a very confused way talking about what a prince and a king is. He was, he called himself a king, but to the English he was a prince because the Welsh leaders would pay homage to the English overlords or the English king. And the interesting nature about that is, is that when William the Conqueror decided to proclaim ownership over Britain, from that moment onwards, a leader in Wales could be nothing, nothing other than a prince. They couldn't become a king because you can't have two kings when one king pays homage to the other. To deal with the confusion, people in Wales called their leaders kings and the English called uh, the leaders over the border princes. Hence why we've got a prince of Wales. It makes sense in a way. Now, do you know what? When I'm doing research like this, I sometimes get very frustrated. And I get very frustrated when I look through my books, I look through the internet, and I can't find something. And the thing that I can't find is something that I saw years ago. I can't find the person's name, and we'll come to that now. In 1972, a book was published by an Ian uh, Jack on medieval Wales, um, and here we go. Jack has a couple of pages on the coin struck for Hulvar in the 900s and briefly discuss claims that other Welsh princes issued coins. The only one of these that Jack attaches much credence to is a report by Edward Cloyd in 1698 that the Bishop of Bangor told him that one of his relations had possessed a coin issued by Llewellyn ap Yorath. 
otherwise known as Llewellyn the Great, who had become Prince of Wales in about 1197 and extended his rule over much of the rest of Wales in the next two decades, his reign ending with his death in 1240. So he was a leader who ruled for 43 years. You could think that that's some of the long distance ruling over a land that you see in the likes of Elizabeth I and Elizabeth II of Victoria. So this is a guy who, who reigned for a while, was able to get stability. Um, Edward Cloyd, a little bit about Edward Cloyd to understand this a bit more. Edward Cloyd was one of those historians writing in the late 1600s who wished to invent a new um, Britishness. In, um, not, a, not an old Celticness, um, Peter, not an old Welshness, not an old, old Britishness, but a new Britishness. Um, and anything to do with the old Welsh leaders, he usually sort of dismissed. But strangely enough, he's talking about this coin. So Edward Lloyd said that the Bishop of Bangor, who, whose knowledge of old Welsh was claimed by Cloyd himself to be even greater than his own, had shown the coin to many of his acquaintances who confirmed his story. Lloyd's account seems to imply that the coin had unfortunately been lost by the time he was told the story. And Ian Jack is much more skeptical of claims for coin production by other Welsh princes and concludes his discussion of the mint and activities of native princes thus. And I'll interject. The evidence amounts to one virtually certain coin, which you can see in the British Museum, folks, when it's open. One very doubtful coin of a, of a doubtful prince. Um, and that's the one. I, I, I scoured everywhere to try and find that person's name. I'd seen it years ago, but I couldn't find it anywhere on the internet. It's been erased. So there's the name of that doubtful prince and the coin. And I couldn't find it. I was very frustrated with that. One well-attested lost piece of Llewellyn the Great and some lost triangular curiosities, whatever they are. We don't have any other information there. With Norman and Angevin mintings in Wales, the evidence, um, the evidence, though still uncomfortably scanty, is much more circumstantial. English coins may have circulated in Wales some extent before the conquest, but even as late as the 1300s, payment in cattle was still very common. And I'm just going to dismiss that last bit there. Uh, the one thing I will say is that um, whether this is of no interest to some of you tonight or is of great interest, I hope it's in the middle at least, um, there are mints of the Normans to be found at Cardiff. And then you have them at Carmarthen in the medieval period, Credland, Herefordshire on the border, Chester, and in other places as well, I do believe in Carnarvon. Um, and the one thing to say about that is, just a little footnote of this lecture, is that what we do find in places like um, Lantwit Major, coins were being produced by every Tom, Dick and Harry in the period of the British Civil War, because there were no coins circulating but they weren't being produced by Welsh princes. So here we go, Howell the, um, and we've got the direct translation, Howell, two nice pellets there and Rex. King Howell is on this coin. This coin itself, I would love to touch this coin. I'd love to feel it. I'd love to, I'd love to get a sense of this coin, but there's only one that we know of. There's only, one in existence in circulation that you can see but there's some hope on the horizon we do know of some roman emperors only by the existence of one or two coins that were minted in a roman emperor's reign and they would have minted millions of coins and none of those coins have survived except for two so we've got some hope yet and the one thing that has to be remarked is you've got an absence of Welsh produced coins by Welsh princes because very few sites 
that the Welsh princes and lords and the people occupied, like Droysling, like those sites we mentioned last week, even the likes of Dinner's Paris have not really been properly excavated. So we don't have those little bits of evidence in the ground. Little tangent warning. Um, for years, I used to tell people that you would, um, it's unlikely that you're gonna find bodies buried in the Iron Age anywhere in Britain. Simply because that's what archeologists said. Archeologists said in the, in the Iron Age, um, bodies were not buried. Um, and everyone thinks, well, they must have been placed in the water or, or burnt and so on. And the reason why people were saying that is because nobody had actually found the evidence. But Michelle did a bit of research on this. And from 2017, they're now working out that people did bury people in the Iron Age. Um, and what I'm trying to say is that because there's an absence of evidence doesn't mean to say that things didn't happen. And that's a really important point. Now, this is rather interesting. Um, on this coin, so if we want to bump the images up again, um, old mouldy coins there. Um, now, we've got a direct translation of what it says on here, but, but before we actually get to this, um, we've obviously got Howell Rex on there, and this name on the back, back of this coin, Gilly. Um, Gilly. Um, this, this, this is rather interesting. And it's rather interesting from another story. This mania, Gillies, G-I-L-L-Y-S, was of Irish Norse descent. So he was used to working with silver. I'll give you a really important fact. Um, he was the mania, and the mania was the standard. If the mania didn't have enough silver in a coin, he could be executed. So you'd put the name of the king on the one side, the obverse, and on the reverse, you'd put the name of the money on the coin. And this coin was minted in Chester. And what we also know, what we also know is this. You would, you would mint coins that the, um, that the dyes could produce. The average die you could produce about 15 to 17,000 coins. So in other words, if in a day, it, so if Gillies was minting coins, he may have minted up to 15, 16, 17,000 of these coins from one single mold, right? So that means that at one point, even if this is one design of coin and the only ones produced by Huldar, uh, just over 15,000 coins were produced. And that's a given fact. You're not going to you're not going to go through the effort of the metal work to produce two dyes, a male and a female um, dye, a, um, a top and a bottom dye. Um, probably using male and female the wrong way in that in that sense. A top and a bottom dye, uh, the anvil dye and and the dye ab uh, above. Um, you're not going to go through the effort if you're only going to produce one coin. So the fact is, thousands of these were made, but only one has been found. Now, this is a little bit more clearer. And you know what? The coin of Hulvar, right, is very difficult to get a clear image of it because you're always taking a photograph through a, a glass cabinet. But this coin itself um, is from Erdmund. Um, and um, Erdmund um, is reigning at the same time as Hulvar. Um, Hulvar is reigning from about 940 to about 950. Eadman, an Anglo-Saxon leader, is reigning from 946 to 955. Um, and the thing is about this coin is that this was minted at the same time as um, Huldar. Um, this is a different mania, but Gillis actually produced coins for Eadman as well. And they are, they are actually quite simple coins, but they're specific. You're, you're producing a message when you're producing a coin. That's the whole point. Um, I do believe that the Royal Mint has just issued a coin celebrating um, Victory in Europe Day um, on the 8th of May, which is two days time. Coins are issued to, um, to remember something. 
um, they're, they're, they're commemorations, commemorations of leaders. Um, so just, just a little bit of information um, on this coin. Um, if we go back, um, we will see um, the obverse and the reverse, and we go to what it's saying. Um, Hopple, Howell, Rex, between two circles, um, two small cross pellets as they, as they got. And on the opposite side, G-I-L, G -I -L, underneath that, Z-U-L-S, otherwise known as Gillis, who is actually the moneyer. So Gillis, Gillis is being commissioned to produce these coins. Somebody once said that the, the coins themselves um, of Hulwer were being meet, minted by an English coin. Wait for it, folks. Were being produced by an English coin um, in homage to a Welsh king. Just think of that. Changes history a little bit, doesn't it? And it does sort of make sense, actually. <laughs> it does in a weird way. You know, 15,000 15, coins being produced by the money of Gillis. And that's just on one day. So how many you can produce in a day, it's said. Um, and and this, is, this is in a mint in Chester, which would have been uh, in Mercian territory, would have been sort of over the border, past Offa's Dyke, when, Brit when England was starting to become unified as one sort of area. It's being produced over the border. Is it the other way around? The English paying homage to the Welsh. I know Gareth would like us to think that. It's worth an idea. Independent Welsh minting never amounted to very much. Bit of a sweeping statement. Do you know what? Coins from the reign of um, Huilvar and um, Llewellyn um, Ap Yorath, um, uh, and there's somebody else. I did a little bit more research. There's a fourth Welsh prince that it looks like issued coins as well. <laughs> so, you know, you scratch the surface, you get a lot more detail, folks. Um, if you find a coin minted in Wales from the Normans anyway, Norman period from Cardiff, they are very rare. They're really valuable coins indeed. Um, and later the regional mints were uh, later closed down, but, 1637, you've got a branch of Tower Mint was established at Aberystwyth Castle, precursor to the Royal Mint being established at Lantrisant in 1968. Its main purpose was to handle local mine supplies of silver. Um, and sometime we don't know when it was closed down, but what's happening is mints are usually established in areas where there's money available. Um, and, be, and before you think, um, that you've got, the, you've got Clog Eye nearby and um, Dolagoth Eye of Welsh gold mines. You know, wouldn't it be great to think that um, sometime in the past, a Welsh prince had a gold coin issued associated with him. That would be, that would be, that would be a moment. And I actually come across that statement there, which I'm not gonna show you again for a moment. I actually come across another coin for, coins produced by Welsh princes. You know, whatever it said about those authenticity of those coins, this is rather interesting. Um, another Welsh prince is said to have issued coins, a Llewellyn ap Cudugan. Not Cudugan of the Rhondda Valley, who, who's about at the time of Oenglindur in the 1400s. This man was born in 1055, the birth of Llewellyn ap Cudugan rather interesting and um and you've got um belt which would refer to built wells at his untimely death in 1099 king Llewellyn at cadogan was an under king of william rufus of england Llewellyn also issued the only known coins of a welsh leader when you read this <laughs> when you read these sources it's almost as if people are not talking to other people at King William's Mint at Carmarthen, he struck coins bearing the legend Llewellyn ap Cudugan Rex. And if you want to, if you want to work out what's going on there, why is there a King William Mint at Carmarthen um, in the reign of um, William Rufus of England, William, William II of, uh, of of England and, and Britain, all the rest of it? Why is there a mint at Carmarthen? 
uh, simply because at that point the Normans had captured territory in West Wales, always going back and forth. But I think this is interesting that um, a Welsh prince minting his coins um, in a Norman run mint a Carmarthen. It's quite strange that, isn't it? And, and the more you look at this, if I had more time to do research on this, it would have been absolutely amazing. So what we're going to do, I'm going to look through this minute. We're going to look at this guy, right? And we're going to look at this. Now, I want to mention a little bit about more about um, Huelbar. That's our coins done. One or two of you are saying, oh, thank God for that. Um, but what we're going to do, we're going to look at a little bit about Huelbar. Um, just a short little bit. Huelbar was that was probably one of the first people um, in Welsh history to unify Wales, to sort of outline where Wales is today. Lots of historians have written in history, when was Wales? Um, and we started off with that um, timeline, if you can remember. But some people believe that Wales was when um, Huelvar united all these different territories in Wales. Um, and it, it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of said that um, by, by the 940s, He's, he's the leader um, of Gwynedd Powys. He's already the leader of Duffydd. Um, he's already the leader of Diabath and Frankanyog and Berlcht and Mycenaeth. Um, so by 942, the, Wales is sort of a united land with these sort of princely kingdoms in the south sort of paying homage to this leader. Um, so when was Wales? 942 maybe. Going back again, there he is, um, and, he, and we do have lots of references to Huel there. His, his laws are admired. And the strange thing is, the strangest thing ever, is um, by 1282, when Wales is conquered by Edward I, um, something known as the Statutes of Rudland that sort of reform what's going on in Wales, um, in fact, Lots of the, up a bit, Carl. Say that again. Can you hear you're me? Breaking up a little bit. What about now? Yes, but you're. That's fine. Good. Um, there was a bit of a connection problem there a second. Don't worry about it. Yeah. So, um, yep, yeah, that's why you're here there for me, Peter. Has it been sounding okay up until now, though? Yes, all good up until now. Yes, great. Yeah. Right. So I'll repeat this again. So, 1282, you've got the statutes of Rudland, and you've got. Edward I um, saying, you know, it's, Wales is now part of England. But with all that, with the period of Oenglindur, and even for a few more years, the original laws that Huel Thar codified for 500 years were basically the laws of, of, of this land, of Wales, until the damnable Tudors come along. And the damnable Tudors, Tudors wreck everything. Um, they um, even by the reign of um, Henry VIII, um, um, the laws of Huelthar are starting to be um, outlawed, but they've lasted 500 years. With all those English kings, with all those conquests, with all the things that we've suffered, Welsh laws still prevailed for 500 years. Rather interesting point there. Um, so you've got this here. And there's a point to be made here, but we'll go on to that in a minute. So just this little chapter, in the laws of Howell Thar, he is styled Prince of Cymru and King of All Cymru. There are three versions of the code. One for the Ven Venedotia, or North Wales, a copy being deposited at the King's Court at Aberfrau. Aberfrau is the subject of my lecture tomorrow. Uh, one for the Demetia of South Wales, which is obviously West Wales, Carmarthen Way, and a copy being deposited at Denevor. Um, so that's for the people of um, Denevor Castle, here you go, for, for West Wales. And then a third copy for Gwent or South East Wales. The laws show that the king had a proper c conception of his dignity. In his great hall at Aberfrau in Gwynedd, the king was invi inviolable the violation of his protection or violence in his presence could only be atoned for by a great fine. 
A hundred cows and a white bull with red ears for each cantref or hundred. He possessed a rod of gold as long as himself and as thick as his little finger and a plate of gold as broad as his face and as thick as a plowman's nail. You're reading through that and thinking, what am I on about? But doesn't that sound great? I'm not going to translate that. His sons, nephews, and any relatives he chose to summon surrounded him and could make free progress amongst his subjects. Of the great officers, the chief of the household came next to the king. He was the um, executive officer of the court. The chief judge occupied at night the seat occupied by the king during the day so that justice should always be obtainable. The duties and privileges of all the members of the king's retinue are minutely described. So in other words, what we're talking about, he was always king, even when he was asleep, because there was always justice. There was always somebody to see. There was always somebody to see um, if something needed to be done. And, and that is true law. Today, today, you know, if you um, go to court, small claims court, you've got to wait a year. If he had a small claim court, you could sort it out in, at night when he was asleep. Brilliant, that. The, this is the sense of those laws. And there's just something else in here, just something really weird. When I went on this search for coins today, I, 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 got, I started to get very frustrated with, the, with mints being in Carmarthen, Cardiff, and then a mint in Rudland. And I, and I started reading this, and I thought, um, why is there a mint in Rudland? at the time of William the Conqueror, when Redland was, was purely the domain of the Welsh. Why are the Welsh producing coins for the English? So if the Welsh are producing coins for the English, why aren't we producing our own? Do you see what I'm trying to get there? I'm trying to say that there's so many layers of this that do not make sense. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to go on to a little bit of sport. So we've got part two now. So a nice little bit of sport, an ancient manly game. And you know what? Um, I did have it here somewhere. Oh, here we go. Um, somebody who's writing a book for Archaeology Cymru. He was one of the last people to actually play bando um, in 1981. Um, and I don't think it's been played since, actually. Um, the boys of land mice, the boys of Margam, the boys of Cowbridge, um, Lantwit Major, and a few other places were involved in the game of bando, bando. And I know some of you are thinking, why are we talking about a game that looks like looks like it's like a bit like hockey, but it's a little bit more violent than hockey. A bando stick from around 1845. So this is over 150 years old. Had you ever heard of bando, Pete? No, can't say I did. No. Here we go. Popular across Wales, especially in Glamorgan, up until the 1800s, the boisterous game of bando was the cause of much local rivalry and violence. So what we're going to do um i'm going to stop the sharing so the only one you're going to be able to see is me is that am i the only one you can see pete yeah yeah with the coins behind you is everybody else only am i the only thing you're seeing uh goff is that correct fingers up yeah yeah we can say we can see you we just got the coins behind you yeah because i've had that, i've had some complaints in the, i've had some complaints in the past of people being able to see um, everybody else and not me. So that's why I've said it. I can see everyone. All oh, right, you can, can you? Right, all right then. Um, how do I not see everybody? Hang on. Um, right, okay. Okay, just, is, is that what, am I, are you just seeing me now? No. Yep. No. What about you, Del? Not now. <laughs> see, golf then. <laughs> Now well, I can see you, yes. I can see you, but everyone else. It, it, it's completing the screen. I don't know why that is. Okay, I'm just, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to read from my text then. Okay. Right, so here we go. Until the late 1800s, Bando was a popular team game across Wales, especially in the county of Glamorgan. John Elias, 
the famous Calvinistic Methodist preacher from Port Kelly, Carnarvonshire, a, a politician, David Lloyd George, um, 1863 to 1945, raised in Carnarvonshire, were both keen players in their youth. While a traveler from Cowbridge to Pyle in 1797 commented on the extreme barrenness of ash and elm on account of their being used to make bando sticks. Bando resembled an early form of hockey as it involved striking a ball with a curved club called a bando across a fixed area of play before attempting to drive it into the opponent's goal. The term bando derived from the French bandy, meaning bent stick, and the clubs used were made of hard local woods, while the ball, similar in size to today's hockey ball, was often carved from holly or box. So in other words, we're using all the traditions of local trees, ash, elm, holly, and box. Gambling, drink, and boisterous behavior. Matches were traditionally held between parishes, and the players often took them so seriously they were known to train in advance. Although Banda was usually played by men, women were keen spectators, and there is evidence that at a Bando match played once in the Vale of Glamorgan, the wife of one of the players concealed the ball with, uh, with her petticoat until her spouse arrived to retrieve it. Games varied depending on the area, for there were no standardized rules. So in other words, if you read this article from 1981 by Brian Ketch, who we're doing a book with, um, there were no rules. You made it up as you went along. No set time limit to the play and no restrictions on the numbers of those taking part. Violence was commonplace. And even if a referee was present, players were not deterred from hitting the opposition with their sticks. Spectators often placed bets on the final score, while local innkeepers ensured that there was always enough alcohol available. This lethal combination of gambling, drink, and boisterous behavior, both on and off the pitch, was eventually responsible for forcing Bando out of existence. <laughs> so it's like many things in this land, the Mary Lloyd, that was banned as well. And interestingly enough, even though... Um, even though the sort of game has disappeared and sort of last paid in the 1980s, um, you sort of get little reminders. This is a, a, a cap badge from the first Glamorgan Rifle Volunteers, which were formed in Margam, Port Talbot, 1859. So this military badge showing two bando sticks was adopted by the volunteers in 1875. And you're just thinking that, you know, it's a really important game. Um, Margam Bando boys. The prominence of the game in Margam is celebrated, uh, as we know, in the Margam um, Bando boys uh, unit. So what we, what I would like to do next is I would like to um, talk a little bit about the May Day festivities and what what I what I'm trying going to have to try and do for next week. Um, is try and get you all off the screen. So, um, unfortunately, you can see each other. So, I'm just going to um, I'm just going to try and um, look. Del is trying to say something. Go on, Del. Go on, Del. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Um, if I'm using an iPad and across the bottom where everybody is on show. Okay. Either side of the screen, there's um, two little round symbols um, above each um, thing with the face. If you press on the, the minus one, which on mine is on the right hand side, it minimizes everybody's faces so we can get rid of ourselves ourselves. Well done. That's what we need. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to keep, I'm going to start, I'm going to start talking now. So um, if you want to do that, and we'll bring us all back on um, afterwards. It's still a learning curve, some of this. Right. So one, one important thing is the fact that we're obviously in May. 
and we have lots of um, customs associated with, with May. Um, and one of those customs associated with May, I always tell about uh, Lantwit Major, um, where, the, where the local farmers um, would have, would force the cattle between two big fires. Um, and occasionally one or two of the cattle would set a light um, to sort of appease the gods and get rid of diseases and all the rest of it. They would chuck a calf into the fire. I've told that a few times. Welsh May Day customs can be strange and odd, um, but here we go. Wales has a wealth of May Day customs, superstitions and traditions that go back to the time um, of the Iron Age, and way beyond that. Known as Callan May or Callan Arf, the first day of May was an important time for celebration and festivities in Wales, as it was considered to be the start of summer. Marking neither an equinox nor a solstice, May Day referred to the point in the year when herds would be turned out to pasture. The lighting of fires were very much associated with the 1st of May. And the various festivals and the various days of the old ways, where we see fires for the Baltane, known as Beltane, represented an opportunity for purification to protect animals from disease. And you know where we're going with the two big fires now, where you're forcing cattle between them. These fire lighting ceremonies were carried out with a great deal of pomp and ceremony. And you know what? We can't do one of these lectures without mentioning Mary Trevilian. In her 1909 book, Folklore and Folk Stories of Wales, des um, describes the preparation for the fire on May Eve in South Wales that took place right up until the mid 1800s. And she writes, the fire was done in this way. Nine men would turn out their, turn their pockets inside out and see that every piece of money and all metals were off their persons. Then the men were, went into the nearest woods and collected sticks of nine different kinds of trees. Now, I don't know if anyone, any of you know how difficult that is. Um, I, I can identify a fair number of trees, but collecting certain sticks that have fallen off certain uh, trees is a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, these were carried to the spot where the fire had to be built. There a circle was cut in the sod and the sticks were set clockwise. All around the circle, the people stood and watched the proceedings. One of the men would then take two bits of oak and rub them together until a flame was kindled. And I think that's amazing that we got that detail about a weird little festivity like that. According to Mary Trevilian, it was not unknown for a calf to be thrown onto a fire, proffered to stop, um, the, to, to stop and prevent the spreading within a particular herd of some kind of disease, you know, because this was, this was the time to get rid of diseases. So we're told by the May Day festivities. Sheep were also given to the summer fire in an attempt to halt uh, this disease. Uh, and to prevent it being spread to the rest of the um, herd um, or um, the flock in the case of the sheep. May Eve, on the other hand, was not just an opportunity for a healthy herd or a flock, it was a chance for divination, usually with the express intent of revealing, one, uh, revealing who one's true love would be. Um, and, you know, we, we talk about this on, on lots of the um, legends and, and myths evenings about um, the sense of divination. There's a lot of superstition out there. Um, also, you've got something known as spirit nights, the um, Asprid Nos. Um, and this took place on May Eve. So, um, so the night before um, May the 1st. It was one of the three nights in the year when the world of the supernatural was closest to the real world. These nights offered an opportunity uh, for divination, usually with the express intent of revealing who one's true love would be. 
Um, and also, it's also a time that you could speak to the spirits. It's also a time that you could maybe find out when you're going to die, for example. I know that's a strange thing to say, but there's a certain church up in um, North Wales that you can ask when you're going to die or ask when somebody else in the village is going to die. These very strange traditions that we've got. Also on May Eve, villagers would gather hawthorn branches and flowers and use these to decorate the outside of their houses. It was believed to be unlucky to bring hawthorn, hawthorn blossoms into the house. In some parts of Wales, Mayflower was collected, otherwise known as cowslip, or probably cowslip. Um, these customs um, celebrated the new growth and fertility of the season. So in other words, um, what we're saying there um, is that this is, a, this is the beginning of the, the new season. Th this, is, this is the fertile season. This is when things really, really grow. It is clear that May Day offered a chance for socializing and banter and mirth and singing and all those festivities. After a hard, often isolating winter, this was a chance for socializing and celebration. Talking to North Wales, Anglesey and Carnarvonshire, um, they had something known as playing straw men, otherwise known as guare gor gult, um, or croggy gor gult, playing straw men. Hanging a straw man uh, was very co a common sight on May Eve. Hanging a straw man. And what does that mean? Let's explain. A man who had lost his sweetheart to another man would make a figure out of straw and put it somewhere in the vicinity of where the girl lived. The straw, was represent, the straw man represented her new sweetheart and had a note pinned to it. In other words, this is our um, Welsh voodoo dolls. However, such attention to a lady could foster jealousy, sometimes leading to fights. Um, singing and dancing were an integral part of the celebrations, with some of the songs sometimes being rather um, bowdy or sexual. Um, so again, that sort of um, boisterous behavior that comes into lots of other things like the Mary Lloyd. Um, we, we've, got, we've got this great um, um, book, this great pantheon of stories and traditions from our land. Um, and then, then we look at sort of, um, we've also got a great tradition of Welsh folk dancing as well. Um, and then it comes into the Maypole. Did you know um, the Maypole is an important part of Welsh May Day tradition, Peter, or did you think it was just an English tradition? Well, I, I didn't realise that, but uh, I go back to the, 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 uh, the saying that, that cast not a clout till the May is out, and the Hawthorn flower is the May. Yes, the Mayflower. And, and Mayflower, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And it, it, it said earlier on about the cowslip, there's different ways of interpreting this, but the main thing <laughs> is you've got the May spring and you've got the sense of the, of, of the incoming life. It's, it's, at this minute, it's all around us. It is all around us. Um, and I, I think, can, go the on. The Mayflower's in front of me at the moment, in full bloom. Love it, love it. Um, so when we come back to the, the May Day tradition and the Maypole called Kodir um, Vedin, raising the birch in South Wales, and Ian Gannon have the um, summer branch in the north. So in other words, it's, it's the raising of the maypole. It's what we did. In the south, the maypole was made of birch. It was painted different colours, and the leader of the dancing would wrap his ribbons around the pole. England all over, followed by the other dancers until eventually the pole was covered in ribbons. The maypole would then be raised and the dancing would uh, begin. So in other words, we've got the maypole tradition there. In North Wales, Kangan Half took place. Up to 20 men would go May dancing. All of the men would be dressed in white and decorated with ribbons, except for two who, who were called the Fool and the Caddy. The Caddy would carry the Kangen Half. 
which was often decorated with silver watches, spoons and vessels borrowed from the people in the village. Singing and dancing, they would visit each house in the village asking for money. And you know what? That's no different from the Mary Lloyd later on in the year. These traditions uh, about community are very strong within our, within our landscape. And relearning these traditions is very, very important. The flora dance comes to mind, where we dance in and out of the houses. Uh, you know what? That's great, isn't it? And, uh, when, when, when we look about that again, we can look at the levels of um, um, the... the, the at, um, we're looking at the Mary Lloyd being very strong in Cornwall. I didn't know that until I started studying it a few years ago. And you've got all these different traditions that seem to intermingle all the way around the country. So, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to share, I'm going to share one last thing for all of us. Um, so we're going to share screen. Um, and if I can um, uh, get to there. Bingo. So what we're going to do, we're going to, uh, we're going to look at one, we're going to look at this here. I, I usually get asked about um, Wales and, and the Welsh language and so on. Um, and this is entitled The Acts and uh, the Welsh Language, um, 1535 Act. Up until about 1535, people still spoke Welsh. It was still sort of um, the tongue that was used in various circles. Did you know that Queen Elizabeth I was fluent in the Welsh language? Um, and as we know, the Tudors come from Cymru, Wales. Here we go, um, 1535 Act. Because that the people of the same dominion have and do daily use a speech, nothing like um, a consonant to the natural mother tongue used within this realm, other, other, what we're talking about, realm, England, we're talking about Britain. Some rude and ignorant people have made distinction on the diversity between the king's subjects of this realm and his subjects of the said dominion and the principality of Wales, um, hereby great discord Variance, debate, division, murmur, and sedition have grown between his said subjects. So in other words, you shouldn't be speaking Welsh. This was occurring in 1535. So up until 1535, things were still being done, um, you know, using Kildar's laws up until then, for a long time. The same section then goes on to say that all and singular person and persons born and to be born in the said principality, dominion or country of Wales shall have enjoy and inherit all and singular freedoms, liberties, rights, privileges and laws within this his realm and the king's other dominion as other the, the king's subjects naturally born within the same have enjoy and inherit. Here we go. I think again, we're saying the same thing. Um, Finally, section 20 of the 1535 Act made English the only language of the law courts. And then from that moment, the identity of the people in this land was erased and said that those who use Welsh would not be appointed to or paid for any public office in Wales. Also, this is how it says, this is what the Act says, also be it enacted by the authority aforesaid that all justices, commissioned sheriffs, coroners, stewards, and their lieutenants, and all other officers and ministers of the law shall proclaim and keep the sessions of courts, hundred leet sheriff's courts, and all other courts in the English tongue, only English folks, and all other oaths of officers, juries and inquests, affidavits, verdicts, and wager of law to be given and done in the English tongue. And also that from henceforth, no person or person shall use the Welsh speech or language, shall have or enjoy any manner of office fees within this realm of England, Wales, or other king's dominions upon pain of forfeiting the same offices of the fees, unless he or they use and exercise the English speech or language. From that moment and onwards, Welsh is banned. Um, and there's an important point to be said there. We'll finish those last two sentences. We've got one more slide to see. But before we go on to that slide, I will read these two out first. This law clause laid the foundations for a thoroughly anglicised English ruling class of landed gentry in Wales, which would have many consequences. The parts of the 1535 Act relating to language were, def were definitely repealed only in 1993. 90 93. 
was the only time that you could legally use Welsh in Wales. And that was in my lifetime, in all of our lifetime, and only a few years ago. And it's only at that point that law in court could actually be in Welsh, 1993. Thing to be said there, right, is that when we're looking at the whole history of Wales, when we look at the castles next week, um, and we look at the, the why things change and why there's differences, because there's clear differences between them over there and us, and this is why we're doing this, for, for us all to learn um, another perspective, um, up until 1535, there were laws in Wales brought to us by Huel Var. Those laws were input, interpreted through the Welsh language. Because you could no longer use the Welsh language in law, Welsh law could not be interpreted in the Welsh language. Therefore, it was invalid because it hadn't been translated into the English language. So the last point, and then we're going to ask for questions is this, I, 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 it was great finding this one. Um, over and over again, I hear the following. If you go to Oswestry and you're caught at night in Oswestry, you could be shot dead with somebody bearing um, a bow and arrow. Um, or if you've got a long bow, you could be executed, all these different things. But I tracked down something that was in writing. I didn't go with what I knew in my head, this, this. Um, so this is what people used to think, um, and then this is a bit of a myth and the reality is on the right hand side. It is legal to shoot a Welshman with a longbow on Sunday in the cathedral close in Hereford, or inside the city walls of Chester after midnight, or a Scotsman within the city walls of York other than on a Sunday. The, um, is that real? The answer is no. This is what this is what this comes from. It is illegal to shoot a Welsh or Scottish person or any other person, regardless of the day, location or choice of weaponry. The idea that it may once have been allowed in Chester appeals to arise from a reputed city ordinance of 1403 passed in response to the Glyndwr rising and imposing a curfew of Welshmen in the city. However, it is not even clear that this ordinance ever existed. Sources for the other cities are unclear. Hereford, like Chester, was frequently under attack from Wales during the medieval period. Unlawful killing are today covered by the Criminal Law Act. So in other words, are all those references to English people having a right to kill Welsh people real? Or is it just made up? You know, are all those things that we're told lies? In other words, um, you know, we've got to look at things twice. What we're going to do, we're going to ask if there's any questions. So we're going to stop screen sharing. Uh, we're going to put everybody's <coughs> mics on. Um, and before we ask any questions, have you all found that useful? Yes. Yes, good. Yes. All good. Good, good, Lots good. Lots of things to look at. <laughs> Excellent. What about you, Gareth? Was that good? Yeah, I can tell. I don't know why. I don't know what flag he's got in the background, but um, is that a declare flag? Or have I got it wrong? You know, he can't speak. Right? Anyone? Anyone want to say anything? Rosamond? No. Um, no, no. We've covered a lot of ground there tonight, Carl. Got lots yeah. of things to look up and research. What about you, Dell? Yeah, to do with um, traditions and traditions of the Hawthorn on May. Um, my family, it, they've always said, wash a blanket in May, wash a life away. So, smelly beds. <laughs> I like it. What about your smelly bed, Peter? Well, the, uh, the, the Cornish language was outlawed at exactly the same time as the Welsh. I and didn't that's why know it that. seems to be spoken so much. I didn't know that. I didn't know, because all I know, you had your, your last um, fluent... Cornish speaker dying in about 1750. Yes, so 1535. I, that was the when it was it was outlawed, similar to the Welsh one. I had no idea about that. What about you, Eleanor? Is there anything you want to say? Put your mic on, Eleanor. I ha I'm just doing that. Um, I was just thinking that um, the Welsh, uh, the English really imposed it on children in school in the, what was it, the end of the uh, uh, 19th century. 
Exactly. exactly. They couldn't speak, um, couldn't speak Welsh. So let alone the laws being, you know, the written on or uh, conducted in um, English only. Um, you know, it seemed horrible that uh, children were forbidden to speak Welsh. Um, <laughs> That's, that's right. It was only in 1993, so you know um, people could still repealed. be repealed. Yeah, yeah, people could still be punished for speaking Welsh up until yeah. 1993. You know. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Goff? And uh, anything you want to say? Oh, no, that's very interesting. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Pam. Yeah, just a small thing. Um, in Somerset, if a Welshman had come into Somerset, he could be executed. And that's what I learned with Bridgewater Archaeological Group. And it's only in recent years that law has been revoked. I, I, I will go with that one. I'll go with that one. So that's that's a bit more solid. Um, Gareth? No, Gareth, we, we what we actually along the side you've got a speech bar, um, which which next week we'll we'll tell you a little bit more about. So you can ask um you, there's a speech bar that we can actually use. Um, Pat, um, anything you want to say? Um, I'm going to ask my husband about the Margam Bando boys because he's got a relative named Thomas Thomas. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, brilliant. A bit of history From there. Margam, so I'm going to ask him. <laughs> um, what about you, Catherine? No, I don't think I have anything to comment on. It's interesting. Thank you. I'm glad you joined us tonight. And Ellie, what about you? No, I don't have anything to comment on. Thank you. Okay, I've, I've really appreciated your support tonight. Just, just, um, just, uh, just like to mention, hopefully I'll see you all next Wednesday. I will, I will mention that when we've, um, um, when we finish this um, series of lectures, we're going to do another eight. Um, so that's good. Obviously, see those who are joining us on Saturday and maybe tomorrow. Um, and it's good that everything's going really well. Um, thanks for your support. And um, if anyone wants to have a chat afterwards, they can. So what we're going to do, we're going to call it a night. Thank you very much. I'm glad you've all enjoyed it. I'm going to say goodnight to Roz, Dell, Goff, Eleanor, Peter, Gareth, Pam, Pat, Catherine and Ellie. Night night. Good night. Thank you. Night night people. Night night. My pleasure. Night night. Night night. Night night. Night night. Night What we're going to have to do is get the writing bar on the side. Um, actually, do you know what we're going to do? There's, there's, there's chat here, right? Um, and Gareth, I'm going to chat to you. Gareth, are you able to type in? Pete, you, you tap in the uh, type bar there. Are you able to do it? Um. Can you see it? If you, in the middle of the screen, it's got chat. Press on chat. Got it? What about, what about um, you, Gareth? Have you found it? In the middle of your screen, it's got the word, it's got chat. No, but, oh, there it is. Right, right, you found it. So, um, see if Gareth can find it now. He's going on and off. Thing is, this technology gets a lot of you getting used to, to be honest with you. Hmm. Well, anyway, we'll work it out. Don't worry. Um, Gareth, I tell you what, if you wanted to send me an email, you're very welcome about tonight. And um, obviously, um, uh, I think, I don't know what's happened. You've obviously heard me tonight. So just send me an um, email, Gareth, and we'll, we'll communicate there. If not, um, Gareth, I will see you um, maybe on the weekend, if you want to do the weekend, which we're doing Monk Nash on the weekend. And... Um, and that's that. So, okay then, um, I'm gonna say good night to you too. Um, Gareth, email me. Peter, I'll see you soon. Take care, Gareth yeah. and Peter. Cheers. All right, ta-da. Night-night, night-night, night-night. Good night, good night. Good night. Good night.